How did we end up here? I can't believe he's gone. This can't be the end. Thomas, your brothers have chosen to follow me. Will you follow also? I will, but I'm unsure of where this journey will lead. Come and see. If I had known the journey would end here, would I have followed? Jesus, we just heard from Nazareth. Lazarus, your friend, has died. They want you to come back home. He is not dead, my brothers. He is only asleep. I wish you could see as I do that life and death do not hold the power you think they do. To our father, death means nothing. You will understand soon enough. Then we'll go with you and die together. Is this what you were trying to tell us? That death was supposed to be the end? What if I believed you? What if my faith was stronger? Brothers, it's almost time to leave you. Jesus, don't leave us. We will be lost without you. You said you'd follow me. Have you changed your mind? No. No. I just mean... Just because I'm not with you, doesn't mean you still can't follow. But if you leave us, how will we know the way? I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. I don't know the way, Jesus. Please don't leave us. As Jesus hung on the cross, with his last breath, his final words were, It is finished. Jesus had died, and as the word made its way to his followers, despair, anger, sadness, and confusion settled. They pulled together connections and resources in the hours after his death to make sure he was prepared for burial. He was placed in a tomb, and that tomb was sealed. The body of Jesus lay in a tomb located in the middle of a garden. The stunned followers of Jesus then realized that they could be next. Fearing the government, they found a secluded room in the city and hid behind a locked door as they tried to figure out their next move. Alone. Scared. And here is where we find them. Waiting. Did you lock it? The door? I did. Yeah, no one saw us. You gotta be sure. Yeah, we're safe. I think. For now. What are you talking about? Didn't you see the rage in the crowd? It's only a matter of time before they find us hiding out. If he was a criminal, what do you think that they think of us now? They saw our faces. They know our names. But weren't you the one that we saw running away? I was terrified. I was watching my savior be crucified. Now we are locked in this room, just waiting to die. Now
We were the ones bringing kingdom come to earth. But take a look at us, take a look at us now. We were the fat revolution. can come from where we're from. We're just a group of outcasts. What are we without him? So now what? Here we are hiding. So now what? What are we fighting for? Jesus was murdered. The movement is over. So now what? On the day Jesus was crucified, grief quickly turned to fear. And we find the disciples hiding in a locked room. As a matter of fact, the biblical account specifically and intentionally says that they locked the door. And if you think about that, that gives you a little bit of insight into their state of mind at that time. But what I want us to understand is that these were the disciples the ones who had walked with Jesus for over three years. They followed him. They left everything to follow him. Their homes, their careers, their families. See, these weren't just some fair weather fans or clout chasers or people trying to get their name up in lights. They believed him. They hadn't been disappointed. They saw the miracles. They saw blind men get their sight. They saw children raised from the dead. They saw women that had an issue of blood for years get healed in an instant. They saw Jesus feeding the thousands with just a few loaves of bread. They literally had a front row seat to God working here on earth. See, The thing that we need to grab is that Jesus actually involved them. He involved these, what people would call nobodies, the tax collectors, the fishermen, the regular degular people, not the spiritual elite. See, God, Jesus, he actually involved them in the healing. He healed people through them. Not only did he heal people through them, he loved them. And so as we look at this, we need to understand that everything was perfect. But now something shifted. Their God was dead. Their God who they followed all these years was now nowhere to be found. And they didn't even get to say goodbye. See, Peter, he actually walked with Jesus on the water. But he had to sit with this reality and this memory that the last time he was in his presence, He was now seen as a traitor, saying, I don't even know him. The rest of the disciples, they had scattered and kind of looked from far off. James, or John, he was actually the only one that actually had enough wisdom or enough courage to come and actually see Jesus die on the cross. But with him, all he could do was sit there helplessly as he watched his friend, his Savior, his God die right before his eyes. And then there was Thomas. See, Thomas was someone who always was seeking an explanation. He was always seeking answers. He was always one that asked the question after the question, you know, the one that nobody else would ask. I think if Thomas were living today, he would be described as an Enneagram 5. 
No offense. But now the God that he knew was dead. And he can't escape this reality that everything is pointing to the fact that the God he trusted in, Jesus, is dead. It is finished. It is done. And we find these disciples hiding in a locked room trying to figure out what to do next. Here's my question for you. Can we make this real? What do you do when everything you've lived your life for is now over in an instant? What do you do when you've dedicated everything to this particular thing, this passion, and now you have to start all over? See, of course, it's kind of easy for us to kind of look back and, and maybe even laugh and chuckle a little bit and maybe even judge them and say they should have had a little bit more faith. See, what we don't sometimes realize is they were in the story. We're just reading the story. And for some of us, we would say, if I could, I would go back and I would shake them a little bit. I would wake them up. I would even give them a theme song and say, we going to be all right. But everything was different. Don't worry. He's alive. Just wait. That's what they were trying to tell him. But maybe that wouldn't have mattered anyway. Why? Because Jesus tried to tell them. He tried to prepare them. He tried to get them ready for what was going to happen. He literally told his friends that he would die. He didn't just tell them that he would die. He told them he had to die. See, the Bible says in, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, it says, From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem. And that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law. That he would be killed and on the third day he would be raised from the dead. He tried to get them ready. Jesus explains to his disciple that he's going to Jerusalem for one reason and one reason alone. And that is to die for the sins of the world. And on the third day, yes, he will rise again. But that can be a little murky. If you really think about it, these, these disciples, they saw Jesus do all these things. And they're like, when it actually happens, they're like, what is really going on? I know he said this, but we didn't really believe him. That was a little extreme. And I think it was a little bit hard to grasp. Because just like us, if we're honest, we have some pretty preconceived notions about what God should do and what he shouldn't do. And the one thing God should never do is die. So why, after all these days, after he was crucified, are the ones who were closest to him hiding behind a locked door? It's simple, because they really didn't believe it in the first place. They actually doubted it all. You may be saying, how can you say that so affirmatively? How can you say that so confidently? I can say it because... What you do actually shows what you believe. The fact of how they responded actually shows that they didn't really believe all that he was trying to set them up to walk in. And we may say that's a little weird because these are the same people who saw Jesus healing the sick, who saw Jesus keep the party going by turning water into wine. He walked on water. He raised people from the dead. Can we pause for a minute? Did y'all hear what I just said? He raised people from the dead. And with all this, they think Jesus is dead and gone and it's all over. How is that? Because the truth is, when it comes to Jesus, when, you, when it comes to hearing about it, you can be around it. You can even grow up in it. You can even read about it or even see a video with an eyewitness account. You can even be in the room when it happens. But how many of you know it's one thing to talk about it, but it's an entirely different thing to actually be about it? So at the end of the day, you know, here it is, no cap. It all comes down to this one thing. It comes down to this one question. Do you believe it? Is the fact that Jesus is alive real to you? 
See, I need you to come and see because while these men were hiding behind the locked door, Mary Magdalene, she said, I need to go to Jesus' tomb. And I want you to let you know, just let you, a little, let you in on a little secret. Jesus had impacted Mary's life so much that she was actually one of his most devoted disciples. He had changed her life. He had set her on a road to prosperity and to freedom. And so she goes down to this tomb to process, to pray, to kind of wrap her mind around what's really going on. She goes to kind of pay her last respects to Jesus by putting perfume on his body and spices on him. She was trying to make sure that if he was dead, at least he would have a proper burial. But when she got there, she noticed that the stone had been rolled away. But as we look into her life and as we just recount it, what we see is that she begins in that moment to have what could seem like a panic attack. Starts to cry overwhelmingly because she believes that the Roman soldiers had come and moved Jesus' body and they weren't going to know what to do with that. And suddenly... The Bible says that two angels showed up looking like lightning shining, one on either side of the tomb. And they ask her in an angelic voice, Mary, why are you crying? Why are you here looking for the living among the dead? Jesus is not here. He has risen. And they say, come and see. Come and see where he lays. And Mary looks in this empty tomb. And just as he's trying to wrap her mind around this, she's walking and she hears this familiar voice saying, Mary. She knows this voice. She's been around this voice for a long time. And she turns around and in disbelief she sees it's Jesus. Now, I need you to lean in for a second. Y'all, y'all knew this was coming. Lean in. Lean in. I need you to come and see what happened next. But I want to let Mary tell you for herself. I have seen.
He's alive. He's alive. I have seen the Lord. He's alive. And that was Mary's message to the disciples that day. And that's my message to you today. That Jesus is alive. That he has risen from the grave. That it's all true. Every bit of it's true. That Jesus wasn't just this figment of our imagination. He wasn't just a random revolutionary. He wasn't just a good preacher or a prophet. The truth is, Jesus was God. As a matter of fact, Jesus is God. And even though it got dark for about three days, I love like the old school preachers would say, they would hold their ear and say, but he got up. Come on, did y'all hear what I said? He got up. He has risen in victory and he's alive. It's amazing. As a matter of fact, it's supernatural because it's really the reason why we are all here today celebrating Easter. Because watch this, Easter is not about Jesus dying on the cross. Easter is about the fact that Jesus rose from the grave. And this same overwhelming feeling, this same overwhelming truth came crashing down on Mary as she was outside of Jesus' tomb. Jesus tells her, to go and tell the disciples what you have just experienced. And so she runs back and she goes and knocks on the door where those disciples are hiding. And she starts to tell them frantically what she had just experienced, that she saw the Lord, she saw Jesus, he saw her, she touched Jesus, and he touched her back. And they needed to know that he was alive. But I need you to just kind of think about this for a moment. She's literally telling them in this moment that their friend, their God, who they just saw brutally murdered on Friday, was now back alive on Sunday? I don't know about you, but that would have been a thing to make me go, hmm. So she told them, and because she told them this out of her experience, they believed her now, right? Because when we hear about Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, the first time, we believe it, right? Sometimes. But a lot of times, it really doesn't work like that. I wish it did, because if it did, my job will be real easy, y'all. I could just get that one sermon, you know, the one that'll slay them. I would travel all around the world, and I would just preach that thing like nobody's business. But it doesn't really work like that, because if that was the case, I could just stand right here in this moment and tell you that your wretched sins, that our wretched sins separated us from God. I could say that God, because of that, he was not content with that separation, that he was unflinching in his resolve, that he didn't want you to perish, that he was relentless in his determination to eliminate that condemnation. That he wanted a relationship with you and us again. Listen, he loves you so much that he will send his only begotten son. Also, Jesus could live a perfect, spotless life to become the perfect sacrifice. He stood in our place of punishment so that we could stand up with him in peace. See, Jesus lived, died, arose again to begin to put everything back together again. And if all I had to do was just to say it at one time so that you would believe, I would just simply tell you that, but that would be a little too easy. Because I could just stand right here and tell you that when you become a Christian, you don't have to be afraid anymore. When you become a Christian, you don't have to be afraid of God, thinking he's looking down on you, trying to judge you for every little mishap you have. Why? Because your sin is gone. 
Literally, the separation is gone. He's drawing you to himself. I could just sit here and say, because Jesus came, he came not just so that you would go to heaven when you die, but so that you would live and live life to the fullest. See, this Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection, it's not even about coming to church a few times a year. It's not about acting like you have it all together, putting on your Sunday's best, putting on your church face. It's about having his life invade your life so that you can be a witness of life. See, what I want you to know is, yes, if it was that simple, I could just stand here and tell you that Jesus came to defeat our enemy, the devil. He came to defeat our enemy, sin, and he came to defeat our greatest enemy, death in the grave. So now, because I say all of that, you believe now, right? You, you believe. Y'all with me? You believe. But some people take a little bit more convincing, and so what we try to let you know is that there have been thousands of years of prophecies and testimonies of Christians and non-Christians alike writing different things about the resurrection and the life of Jesus. Scientists would even acclaim that Jesus walked the earth. Thousands of years of people hearing from Jesus, experiencing him with dreams, signs, and wonders. And because I tell you that, now you believe, right? But sometimes... It takes a little bit more than someone just telling us for us to believe. And so as we walk through this, just like the disciples, we have questions because we've been through stuff. We see God a lot of times through the filter of our own experiences. And how we have these experiences shape us to, to think about this forgiveness and to think about this resolve and to think about this sacrifice that was given to us. And sometimes we miss the mark because we're trying to think about it in the way that we think. But his thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. If the truth be told, a lot of us have had some bad leaders that we've experienced. As a matter of fact, there are several people even in this room that maybe you had a bad father, someone who didn't do everything right. Can we just make this personal? We've sinned a lot. Let me make it real, real. I've sinned a lot. And so when we hear these bad leaders, when we hear different people trying to tell us that we have this good God, that he wants to walk with us, he wants to draw us close, I don't blame a lot of people for being just a little bit skeptical. But I wish more than anything in this moment right here, because you showed up today, because you're engaged and God is already speaking to you, I wish that I could just tell you and you would believe me because it's all true. Literally, it's all true. And that fact of knowing that it's true changes everything. But here's the thing. You have to answer a question for yourself. And this question that you have to answer for yourself is, do I believe? Do I believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Do I believe that he died in my place so that I can have eternal life? Do I believe that he's my Savior? Because this whole thing that I'm talking about right now, this whole thing that we're even celebrating, it comes down to one thing, and that's faith. And so that first night when Mary burst in the room behind his locked door, knocking on the door, trying to get in, her words were so filled with truth, but their minds were so filled with doubt. In fact, I, I want to quote that they said they did not believe her because her words seemed to them like nonsense. Have you ever been trying to explain something good that happened to you or just kind of share a moment with somebody and you're trying to get the words out and the words are not coming out right? They act like they don't understand what you're saying and you just start saying, you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? And they're like, no, we don't know what you're saying. <laughs> Everybody's now frustrated in the room because they're trying to see what she's actually excited about. And what happens is that the Bible says that out of the 11 disciples that were there at that time, nine of them actually doubted. And the two that 
didn't doubt. They only didn't doubt because they looked at each other. Peter and John, they looked at each other and said, hey, we need to go see for ourselves. They ran down to that tomb. And to their surprise, when they looked inside, they saw Jesus' clothes folded up. But Jesus was nowhere to be found. And the Bible says that's when they believed. That's what they needed. And so they ran away and they told the other disciples. And when the disciples are all together again, they're in this room. Jesus walks through the wall, y'all. No, no, I don't think y'all got that. They said the door was locked and Jesus walked through the wall. I wish I had that superpower. And when he does this, they kind of freeze up a little bit. They, they kind of get speechless. I would get speechless. And Jesus breaks the silence in only the way Jesus can. And he says, all eyes on me. <laughs> no, nah, he didn't say that, y'all. He didn't say that. He didn't say that. He said, peace. Peace be with you. Look at the scars in my hand. Look at the scar on my side. And right at that moment, the room erupts with joy because they now realize that Jesus is alive. Come on, they realize it. And now all of them believe. Well, almost. Because there's a little plot twist in this story. Somehow in the midst of Mary running away down to the tomb and coming back and telling them and and Peter and John running and coming back and and Jesus showing up in the room, Thomas is nowhere to be found. And we really don't know where Thomas was at that moment. Maybe he was trying to medicate. Maybe he went to his local ice cream store, the local Jenny's of Jerusalem, (laughs) went to Bar Taco to get some food. Maybe he went to go talk to the authorities to see what the streets were talking about. Or maybe he just said, look, I need a break. I need to take a mental health day. We don't know. But we know that he missed it. He missed the moment where Jesus was in the room. Oh, my God, what it would be like to miss the moment where Jesus was in the room. And when he returns, he is told this unbelievable story that Just come and see for yourselves. Thomas, Thomas, listen, you're not going to believe it. It's true. Jesus is alive. Yeah, I know. I was here when Mary No, 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 no. He was here. What do you mean? But after you left, John locked the door behind you, and we asked Mary to tell us the story again. And when she started talking, Jesus... That can't be true. Brother, listen to me. It is true. He's alive. You just have to believe him. Unless I can see. Unless I can see him. I just can't believe what you're telling me. Unless I can see him. Unless I can see his scars and touch his wounds. Don't you understand? I can't just believe just because you said it or because Mary said so. I have to see it for myself. No. I wish it were easy for me I've had these questions and I've had these doubts haunting me more than his grave. But what if it's true? All that they said, all of these voices, they swirl in my head. I wish it were easy for me to believe, but the truth just keeps spinning away. Round and
would he invite me to enter his dance for traveling lies that he's dead but what if it's true all that he said quiet these voices with his voice instead if only he'd show me the scars in his hands and the truth would be all I have left. Round and around and around and around on this merry-go-round of doubt. Dancing in circles that I can't get out of this merry-go-round, this merry-go-round of doubt. Thomas. Thomas. There's nothing more to say, brothers. I don't know how to follow anymore. Unless I can see him and touch him and know that he's real. I, I just don't think I can stay here any longer. Thomas. No. Thomas, it's me. Yeah. Peace be with you, friend. I don't understand. Thomas, it's me. But how can I possibly know if this is real? I followed and believed for so long. I thought that it was true that you, that he, could be the Messiah. And now? What has changed in you, brother? I saw you die! take your lifeless body from the cross. I saw them wrap you in linen, and I saw them place you in the tomb. I watched as they rolled the stone into place. Thomas, do you remember what I told you? What? Death does not hold the power that you think it does. Thomas, I'm here because you said you needed to see me with your own eyes. So look. Look and see that I'm alive. Come and see my scars. Touch my wounds. Come and see me. I don't, I don't know. Stop doubting what you see, friend. Believe me. I don't know if I can. You can. Just come and see. I, I don't know if I know the way back to you. Thomas, I am the way. I love you all so much. You believe in me because you have seen me, but there will be so many more after you. Bless them. Those who have not seen me, but still believe. I love this moment so much because if we really think about it, there was really no reason for Jesus to come back into that room again. 
See, we already had the big reveal. He had already revealed himself to everyone except for Thomas. And so it could have been said that, Thomas, you just need to take our word for it. Thomas, you should have just sat still and stayed here with us. You're lost. See, they didn't have the ability back then to capture and post an Insta story to show him later that it really did happen. And so some would say, Thomas, you just have to trust what everybody else is saying. But what I love about Jesus is that he doesn't roll like that. Jesus came back for Thomas. He appears in that locked room again. Why? Because Thomas needed him to. He needed him to. See, you heard it from Thomas. Unless I can see him with my own eyes, unless I can feel him with my own hands, I will not believe. So Jesus gives Thomas exactly what he needs to believe. He comes back into that room. He says, here I am, friend. Come and see that it's all true. See, Jesus knew Thomas just like he knows you. He knew for Thomas just hearing about it was not going to be enough. As a matter of fact, Jesus knew Thomas better than Thomas knew himself. Jesus knew what Thomas needed, and he said, I'm going to come and meet him right there at that point of belief and now lead him to faith. I want you to notice what Jesus didn't do. Notice what he didn't do. He, he didn't berate him or clown him. Jesus didn't come in the room like, oh, Thomas, here we go, Thomas. Thomas, you so needy, Thomas. You need to see me, huh, Thomas? Well, here I go. No. He said, I'm going to meet you right where you need me. But what I wanted to pay attention to is that Thomas, he kind of gets a bad rap. Because at some point in history, he picked up a not-so-great nickname that kind of stuck. You've heard it before, Doubting Thomas. It's the number one attribute that we've associated with him. But I want you to think about this. With all the things that he did, with all the years of devotion that he had, with all the sacrifice that he made to see Jesus move around the earth and to help propel the message, Thomas had left everything to follow him. By a show of hands, can, can, I, can I get you to raise your hand if you can honestly say that you've left everything to follow Jesus? Not a whole lot of hands go up on that one. Thomas is the one who just a few months before this, when everybody else was scared, when everybody else was trying to run away, they were afraid of the persecution of Jesus, Thomas piped up. He said, I'm going to be a leader right now. He said, let's go with Jesus so that we may die with him. Bro, I don't know if I would have been able to do that. But right after this moment, this is when Thomas actually said, okay, I'm going to be one of the first people to proclaim the deity of the Lord. He says, my Lord and my God. And he later becomes an apostle. He's one of the ones that helped to launch the New Testament church. He went through India and then through China preaching the gospel, the good news. And then on his way back through India, he was killed with a spear because of his devotion to Jesus. Thomas was a martyr. And we call him Doubting Thomas. Imagine being known by everyone for the rest of time by a weak moment. Imagine if people looked at you and they called out and say, hey, 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 there's go, there goes lustful ratchet Rachel. <laughs> or, oh, hey, 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 there goes going broke on the sneakers app Steve. <laughs> he can't even control himself. Doubting Thomas? I don't think that's what Jesus called him. And watch this, I don't think that's what Jesus calls you either. I think that Jesus, he wasn't bothered by the fact that Thomas wanted to come and see because he knew Thomas was more than his doubt. 
He saw Thomas for who he really was. He could see past the doubt and see that he really wanted to follow. And you know what? I don't think Jesus is bothered right now in this moment, even while I'm speaking, that you have some doubts or some questions that you want to bring to him. Let me say this. There is nothing wrong with doubt as long as the type of doubt that's brought to Jesus. See, God is okay with your doubt. As long as it's not this passive-aggressive, arms crossed, prove it to me, Jesus. But it's a doubt that says, I want to believe, but help my unbelief. I want to believe that everything is true. I want to believe that you're alive, but please help me believe. Do something. Flick a light or something. See, that's the posture that God will respond to every time. So maybe you're like Mary. Maybe you're in this room today and you've actually had an experience with Jesus. You've told other people about Jesus. He set you on the path of greatness. You're doing well. You have a testimony and you're not ashamed about it. But I want to let you know it should not stop there. There is still more for you. I'm encouraging you today to continue to tell people to come and see the Jesus you've experienced. But maybe you're like one of the disciples who you heard about Jesus by secondhand information and you still believe. What I say to you is, as the Bible says, blessed are those that have not seen but still believe. But I want to let you know there's still more for you. And the more is the fact that you can still experience Jesus for yourself. But maybe you're like Thomas. Maybe you just need a little bit more evidence. People have told you stories. You've even sat in church services before this one, and you still have doubts. And if you're honest, sometimes you start to look at yourself like, is something wrong with me? Why does everybody else seem like they're believing and I'm having this challenge? You kind of feel like God is looking down, sitting up high in heaven, looking at you with a microscope saying, doubting Thomas. Or doubting Mary, doubting John, doubting Emily. No, he's not calling that. God is not sitting waiting to reject you because of your doubts. As a matter of fact, I want to let you know that God can handle your doubts. Not only can he handle your doubts, God can handle your questions. See, a lot of times we've been told, don't question God, just have faith. No, that's not enough sometimes. See, God can handle you asking him the question over these last two years. God, why did my uncle, who I love, that would always give me that $20 when I saw him, why did he have to die of COVID complications? Why, as I'm trying to live a godly marriage and I'm trying to live for you and and it doesn't seem like things are going right, it looks like we're headed for divorce. Why, God, it doesn't look like my spouse really wants to be in this, but you said we are to be together. It's okay to ask him that question. It's okay to ask them the question that after you've worked a job for 25 years, 30 years, and now they let you off with one month of severance or none at all, to ask him, why? I've been faithful. I was sowing good seeds. I don't know what's going on. And and watch this. He even can have you ask him this. God, you said you want us to be fruitful and multiply, and I did the right thing. I waited till I was married, or at least I stopped. And I picked it back up after marriage. (laughs) And now we're trying to have kids and it doesn't seem like it's going to happen. And, you know, all we want to desire is to have this this junior me walking around. And what's going on? He can handle you asking him the question about that. And he can even have you ask him the question that you would not say to anybody. The struggles internally that you're having. The thing that if somebody knew, they may cast you out. Let me tell you something. God is not going to cast you out for asking him the question. See, for me, my story is a little bit different. I was a doubter among believers. I grew up in the church. I was like a little church kid. I used to be doing my shout. (laughs) You know, we would be at church all day and all night, pack breakfast, lunch, and dinner in the wax paper. But how many of you know you can actually be a person who grows up in the church while not letting the God of the church affect you? 
See, I grew up hearing about the grace of God. I grew up hearing about God wanting to do these great things for me, that he wanted to absolve me and forgive me of my sins. But what I found was that I believed in God in theory while not engaging with him in practical practice. I came to a point that with all these things, I wanted to taste and see if this sin thing was so bad. I wanted to go find out what I was missing. And instead of actually coming to see Jesus, I went and saw the world. Let me let you know something. That didn't work out too well for me. It's like my grandmama used to say. She would say, Andrew, she did not call me Mo. As a matter of fact, she would call me this other name that I'm not telling none of y'all. <laughs> she would say, baby, a hard head makes a soft behind. And I had a hard head. Life was kicking my butt. And on the inside, I was lost. I was feeling lost. But on the outside, I looked like I had it together. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever been around truth and not been affected by the truth? Have you ever been in church and even thinking with God, like, is there, there has to be more than me just coming to church on Sundays and suffering from Monday to Saturday? God, is there more? I want more. There needs to be something real that I experience. And I remember when my life took a turn, I vividly remember when everything changed for me. I was sitting in a church service, and the pastor started to speak from this particular verse of Scripture that has become a life scripture for me. It's Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid it. And for the joy over it, he goes and sells all he has and buys that field. He, or he abandoned everything to go to that field. And something clicked in me that day. The thing that clicked in me that I realized that nothing is going to compare to the peace of God in my life. That until I submit myself to him fully, with my questions and all, that I will not see the goodness of God in the land of the living. And I had to start depending on him and say, I'm going to come and see you, God, in the way that you are created to be seen. He wants to bring you in. He wants you to see him that way. And in that day, I was invited to lay my life down. I was invited to make a change. I was invited to come into a new reality with Christ and repent and turn. And I realized something very clear that at that moment, God was calling me to come and experience Jesus for myself. Not my grandmother's testimony, not my parents' testimony, but for myself. And so as we look at this, I just want us just to really just kind of soberly take this in. Because I was lost and didn't even know I was lost until the one that was trying to find me told me that I can come home. And my life since that moment has never been the same. See, I don't just smile because it's the right thing to do. I smile because it's like fire shut up in my bones. I smile because God has been good to me. I smile because he took me from a place of sin and still said, you can still come and see me in my love. Did you know that it is possible to consider yourself a believer and still be lost in doubt? See, my burden today is not just to tell you about Jesus. It's to let you know that he can handle your doubts. He can handle your fears. He can handle you trusting him with it. Because in one of the most famous of stories, Jesus actually tells us about how he sees you, 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 and me. And he says this. He says, if a man has 100 sheep and one of them gets lost, what will he do? Won't he leave and go and search for the one that the lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he will joyfully carry it home on his shoulders. When he arrives, he will call together his friends and his neighbors saying, Rejoice with me because I have found my lost sheep. In the same way, there is more joy in heaven over one, over you. One lost sinner who repents and turns to God than over 99 who are righteous and haven't strayed away. This is what I need you to know. Jesus always comes back for the one. But let me tell you, there's more good news with that. He comes in the way that he knows you need it. 
He's not trying to make you ascribe to somebody else's testimony. See, Thomas needed to see him for himself. Mary needed to see that empty tomb. Peter and John, they needed to see those clothes. All the other disciples, they needed to see him in the room that was locked. When I was 17, I needed someone to tell me about the goodness of God and explain to me what God wanted to do, to explain with me that the life that I was living was just limited and God had abundant life for me. But my question to you today is what did you need to believe? As a matter of fact, let's make this personal, let's make it real. What do you need to believe today? See, God is right here in this room. He's here with us. And when we open ourselves up to him, what we see is that he's such a loving God that in a room full of hundreds of people, he's talking to you. He's talking to you. He's talking to you. He's talking to you. He's coming to your level to let you know that he loves you so much that he wishes that you do not perish. And he's not waiting to judge you. What he's saying is peace be with you. See my scars. See that I've sacrificed for you. See my back that I was beaten so that you can be made whole. I was once dead, but now I'm alive. What he's saying to us all, he's saying, my son, my daughter, he's saying, listen, there's no more need for you to doubt. Just believe because I'm here with you and I can handle it. And at that moment when we hear that, our only response is for us to respond in love, to respond to this perfect God by doing just like Thomas did by saying, my Lord, my God, my Lord, my God. Because now Jesus is not just the God of other people's stories. He's the God of your story. He's the God of your story. He's the God of our story. And so what I want to do right here in this moment is I want to pray for you. So I'm going to ask that everyone, you bow your head and close your eyes. This is a moment with you and God. And God, I pray right now, we say thank you for sending the best gift of all, yourself, Jesus Christ. Jesus, you're at the center of everything right now. You're at the center of our attention. You're at the center of our hearts. You're at the center of our fears. You're at the center of our cares. You are at the center of our questions now. And God, we just want to take a moment like nobody else is around. And we want to let you into our doubts. We want to let you into those questions. And right now with your head bowed, I just want you to take this moment and I want you to get that question, that doubt, that fear in your mind. And I want you to say this. Say, Jesus, I bring you my questions. I bring you my fears. I bring you my doubts. I can't seem to get over this thing. And whatever that thing is right now, I just want you to say, Jesus, what do you have to say about this? Thank you, God, that you are so patient with us, that you're so loving towards us, that you take the time in a room full of people and you look at us as one. And right now, we want to respond to that great love by the faith that we have in you. And so as those heads are continued to be bowed, I want to ask you if today is the day that you don't want to just know about Jesus, but you really want to know him for real, for real, that you want to now come to him with your questions, with your doubts, and with your fears, and with your life, and really be open to him. If today is the day that you're deciding, yes, Jesus, I want to take one step with you and let you do the rest, 
If that's you in the room, I want you, while every head is bowed, to lift one of your hands way high in the air so I can see you. I see those hands. Come on, lift those hands high. I'm praying for you right now. I'm I'm, I'm directing my prayers toward you right now because you need to know that Jesus loves you. You need to know that as you put your hand up, you have actually taken a step into grace. As you put your hand up, you are now taking a step for God to know you and for you to know him. Come on, put that hand up high. Nobody else is looking at you. But God sees you. I'm waiting on a few more people who have said, I've done too much. You don't know my testimony. You don't know the questions that I really have that I can't ask. You don't know that I'm struggling with my identity and I I can't tell anybody that because they look at me one way. You don't know that I did something that if anybody found out, I will be locked up. But Jesus is not here to judge you right now. Jesus is here to save you. So just keep those hands up. I'm I'm literally praying for you right now. Your, Your life is dependent on this moment right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All over the room, I want you to repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I say yes to you. You are the Son of God. You died for my sins and you rose again. You are alive. And today, I confess that you are my God and you are my Savior. So I repent and I turn from my sins. And I turn to you with hope and with joy. Help me to live for you from this day forward. Right now, I declare that I am forgiven and I am loved. That I am forgiven and I am loved. That I am a child of God forever. All because of Jesus. All because of Jesus. Come on, all because of Jesus. And we say amen, amen, and amen. Come on, can we celebrate? Come on, can we celebrate? There are literally a few hundred people that just went from darkness into light. Can we celebrate a great God? Can we celebrate that he's alive? Can we celebrate that he will never leave you or forsake you? Can we celebrate? The God of all wonders, the God of majesty, the God of your story, the God of my story, the God of our story. Somebody say yes to Jesus. We're going to take a moment right here while the fire is hot and we're going to celebrate our Lord and Savior and declare like Thomas did that he's our Lord and he's our God because there's no other name like Jesus. Let's lift up a praise to him right now. We honor you, Lord. You are worthy. The voice that spoke existence Would whisper it is finished The hands that hung the heavens Were nailed to his creation The feet that walked in Eden Would walk the road of suffering Who is this God of mercy? The one and only King The one and only Jesus Our hands 
to worship to our King. We said, Though darkness thought it bare, the light with all his glory, up from the tomb came roaring, the resurrected King. Lifted high.